Henrik Fisker has had one of the most varied and exciting careers in automotive design in recent memory. He has designed some of the most beautiful cars of the 21st century and helped bring Ashton Martin into a new era. In addition to his contributions to the automotive industry, he's also worked on watches, furniture, and yachts. Most people probably know him for his company, Fisker Automotive, and the car they produced, the Fisker Karma. Henrik Fisker was born in Ali Roo, Denmark in 1963 and attended Art Center's ill-fated European campus in Vevey, Switzerland. He was hired by BMW after graduating in 1989 and was assigned to BMW Technik, the brand's advanced design studio in Munich. His first project was a 1991 E1 concept, an electric city car that very much resembles the brand's own i3. It was conceived as a response to a recently implemented California mandate requiring 2% of all new cars sold in the state to be zero emissions. While the lines were a bit softer than the ones on their production cars, the Hoffmeister kink and quad bulb headlamps give a sense of familiarity. The kidney bean grill initially seems like a puzzling addition. The car is completely electric and doesn't have to cool anything. Fisker used it to hide the charging port, which helped further streamline the design. Despite being just over 136 inches long, the E1 made the most of its small footprint by having a surprising amount of interior space. It doesn't have an engine, so designers were able to push the passenger area up without compromising the car's footprint, freeing up enough room for four people. The styling wasn't the only thing the car inherited from BMW. Despite having only 45 horsepower, it was quite enjoyable to toss around, thanks to no small part to the extensive use of aluminum and plastic. This resulted in the curb weight of under 2,000 pounds. Autocar tested the car back in 1992 and had good things to say about the driving dynamics. The E1 doesn't have to apologize for its electric motor because it places it in an entirely modern context. It has a great shape, even better space efficiency, a superb ride, crisp handling, a whisper quiet drivetrain, and a truly seamless transmission. Even by BMW standards, it's a hard hitter. BMW used the car to test bed for their electric technology and even considered rolling out a smaller run. Things looked bright for the E1, but the story doesn't have a happy ending. The California mandate was eventually dropped, weakening the business case for the car. The final nail in the coffin was when the Mark I version caught fire while charging and burnt down a nearby building. BMW wouldn't return to the idea for another 22 years. Chris Bangle joined BMW that year and kicked off a five-year-long project which materialized into the 1997 BMW Z07 concept. They actually unveiled two variants of the car, a bubble roofed coupe and a convertible with a fin behind the driver's seat. The cars debuted at the 1997 Tokyo Auto Show, and they turned out to be the first in a string of iconic Fisker designs. It draws heavily from the 1957 BMW 507 convertible, as evidenced by the white kidney bean grill, the sink of side vent, and Coke bottle styling, Sketches from early in the Z07's development cycle depicted a sharper, more aggressive interpretation of the car. The lines were softened to a more effectively capture the essence of the 507. The Z07 saw production at the Z8 in the year 2000, virtually unchanged. The coupe variant was dropped in favor of the convertible, which meant the roof was left on the cutting room floor. The convertible also lost the fin behind the driver's seat. This didn't stop the car from becoming an icon the world over. The exterior design brought in heaps of praise and won the 2000 Red Dot Design Award. It's one of the few cars from the wave of retro futurism that captures the timelessness of the car that inspired it. Fisker became the head of BMW Design Works in Newbury Park, California in 1999 and remained there until 2001. He moved to Ford to become design director of Aston Martin, which they had acquired in 1991. He stepped into an odd situation. Ian Callum was design director of Jaguar, which was also under Ford's control. In addition to his duties here, Callum also led projects at Ashton Martin. He oversaw the development of the DB7, Vanquish, V8 Vantage, and DB9, but Fisker arrived before work on the latter two finished and took them over. There is a fair bit of contention between the two regarding who rightly deserves the credit for the designs. They have two very different accounts, as evidenced by separate interviews with car and driver. Ian Callum claimed he did pretty much 100% of the DB9 and a good 80% of the Vantage. He pointed to the Vanquish as evidence, saying, 
you only have to look at the TP9 to see who designed it. It's a Vanquish with a dinner jacket on. Fisker claimed the V8 Vantage was definitely a car that I sat down and had to sketch myself. Regardless, Fisker played at least a considerable role in further developing the brand's design language. Styling developments include a reworked grill, more pronounced hood detailing, and tail lights that reference the brand's logo. Fisker was promoted from his post at Aston Martin and became the director of Fort Global Advanced Design Studio in 2003. Projects completed under its leadership include the Ford Shelby GR1 concept car. Much like his time at BMW, Fisker found himself in a very senior position at Ford. There was definitely more room for him to move up in the company, but he left his position on December 24, 2004. He felt he'd done it all in a corporate world and dreamt of something far more ambitious. He went into the business with colleague Bernhard Kohler and founded Fisker Coach Bill in 2005. Like the name implies, the company's goal was to revive the seemingly lost art of designing and producing one-of-a-kind cars for discerning customers. It sounds awfully romantic, but there's a reason why it went out of style. Modern regulations and ridiculously high development costs have essentially killed the practice. Fortunately, Fisker had a few tricks up his sleeve. An article from the New York Times in 2005 detailed the process. To make a Tremonto, the company will buy a new Mercedes-Benz SF55 AMG. The Latigo will start as a BMW 645CI. The body panels will be cut off and the interiors will be gutted. Then aftermarket tuner shops will tweak the V8 engine for more performance. The Tremonto, for example, is intended to have 610 horsepower and more than 650 pound-foot of torque. Though the buyer can skip the powertrain modifications, stick with the 493 horse V8 as delivered by Mercedes and save $43,000. Then Fisker will add a small herd's worth of plush cowhide and luxury appointments, refit 20 inch custom wheels and low profile tires, and attach painted carbon fiber body panels to the chassis. Traces of the donor cars can be clearly seen on the profile view, but both cars still have design elements that will later become indicative of Henrik Fisker. The strike from the logo will appear to continue down and bisect the grille. The Latigo's taillights look different from the 6 Series and have their own distinct design, but the Tremontos give off Sierra's Alfa Romeo GT vibes. They plan to build 150 of each, but only ended up making a fraction of that. Only 15 Tremontos and 2 Latigos were ever built. The firm also designed the bodywork of the Ortega GT sports car, which debuted in 2007. Fisker Coach Build, which relaunched with Fisker Automotive in 2007. You can learn more about the formation and history of Fisker Automotive here but his first project was the Karma electric sedan. It was shown at the 2008 Detroit Auto Show, but it didn't reach production until 2011. The Karma didn't look like anything on the road, but it also shared several design features from a few of its earlier designs. The electric powertrain allows the car to be lower, wider, and longer than it probably ought to be. It appears this way because the wheels are pushed to the very edges of the minimal front and the rear overhangs. The Karma has a variation of the grille from the Latigo and Tremonta, instead of going from one side to the other uninterrupted, and it's right as it reaches the logo. The lower front and rear clips introduce the diamond motif, a feature Henrik would occasionally return to in the future. The tail lights also share the diamond shape and somewhat resemble the ones from the Latigo. The interior makes heavy use of deep, earthy tones. The seats have a sort of two-tone appearance that spills from the center console. Henrik also worked on a more affordable model, the Atlantic. It has a flowing, fastback roofline, even more so than a larger Karma. The headlights don't hug the wheel curve. Instead, they're crisper and cut off at the wheel gap. The rear door handles are tucked behind the window, which adds to the coupe effect. It also ditches the Karma's solar roof for an equally distinctive four-piece glass pattern. Lastly, the taillights sweep right under the nolter. Henrik left his own company in March of 2013 after major differences with management on strategy. Instead of bowing out of the design world, he set up HF Design and Technology, a Los Angeles design house later that year. One of the most notable projects was the Viking, the result of a collaboration with Log Jensen Motorcycles. He also tried his hand at coach building multiple times. The Galpin Fisker Mustang Rocket was born from another collaboration, this time with dealer and customization titan Galpin Auto Works. It utilizes a 725 horsepower V8 and extensive use of carbon fiber. They've also worked with Bonetti, an Italian yacht maker, on a $37 million vessel. Recently, Fisker has run into some trouble with his former employer. 
Astrid Martin made him pull the plug on a Fisker Thunderbolt, a modified Vanquish, in April of 2015. They claimed the Thunderbolt bore too much of a resemblance to the Vanquish. Fisker opted to avoid a potential lawsuit by halting development on the car. They clashed about a year later when a sketch of a then upcoming car, the VLF Force One V10, surfaced. Astrid Martin backed off, however, once they saw the car in the flesh. They stopped with the threat, and Fisker was free to continue working on the car. He established another company bearing this name, Fisker Incorporated, in October of 2016. The brand would act as a spiritual successor to Fisker Automotive, and the first car, the Fisker E-Motion concept, debuted in 2018. It takes the fastback silhouette and mustache grill and throws in two sets of butterfly doors, autonomous technology, and a driving range of 400 miles. It's a concept now, but those curious can put up a refundable $2,000 deposit to reserve one for themselves in the future. During his stints at BMW and Ford, he's worked on some of the most celebrated cars of the new millennium. He's often been compared to Preston Tucker for putting his own car in the market, and has even planted seeds for a design empire. Henrik Fisker has had a life in design that few others have, and is definitely an industry icon.